Wally Perling was a nine-year-old who lived not far from Atlanta, Georgia. He was a bit disabled and intellectually delayed. Although he was not as quick and bright as the younger youngsters, everybody loved Wally Perling. He was kind. He was a loving soul. And the big event in his town was to take part in the Christmas pageant. Wally Perling was so anxious because the year before he was in that Christmas pageant. And he was anxious to be in it again. He wanted to be a shepherd. However, the shepherds, they had a large speaking role. And so Wally just couldn't remember the lines. So they had to pass them up for it. So they made him the innkeeper instead. He had only one line, which consisted of two words, no room. The teacher said to him, now, Wally, when you say your line, be very stern and very tough. So Wally Perling practiced, and he practiced, and he practiced. The night of that pageant had arrived. There came that point in the performance when Mary and Joseph stood at the door of the inn and they knocked. Wally came out walking tough as if he knew how to walk. And then Joseph said, my beloved Mary is about to give birth and we need a place for a while. Wally looked at Mary, and then there was one of those long pauses that sometimes happens in children's Christmas pageants. Silence. His mom and dad were saying the words to their mind. No room. No room. Come on, Wally, just say it. No room. The people in the audience were made uneasy by that long silence, but they weren't really paying attention to Wally. Wally wasn't looking tough anymore. No, Wally, he had tears in his eyes. And suddenly he blurted out words that no one expected to hear from him. I'm supposed to say no room, but you can have my room for the baby. What does the Bible say? A little child shall lead them. A little child shall lead them. That innkeeper has been discussed for thousands of years. And why? Because he missed his moment of opportunity when it came. Granted, it was a busy time. It was a time when all of these people were swarming around, coming to pay their taxes to register. And when there came yet one more knock at that door, he never realized what was about to happen. It'd be the most important thing that would happen to him in all of his life. Strange, isn't it? A time is best measured not by its duration, but it's measured by its content. What happens? One can live more in an hour than in an entire week. Sometimes whole centuries, they're defined by what happens in just a single day a single moment. And when a moment comes, we can exult in it, or it can turn into a moment of disgrace that will live in history forever. So many times, so much is won or lost on the basis of what we do, 
in a moment of opportunity when it comes. The knock was heard, but the innkeeper missed the moment. He said, sorry, I have no room. Now, if he had known the identity of his guest, if he had ever dreamed that a child born in a stable would literally split history in two between an Old Testament and a New Testament, that a child that was to be born that night would be the one in which we in the world today date all of our letters. Surely, if he would have known, he would have made room. He would have made room for them. He would have found some type of an arrangement. He didn't know that the travelers and his wife, burdened with an unborn child, were so important. But then, do we ever know when God comes knocking at our door? What if he's knocking tonight? We're impressed with shiny things, showy things, and noisy things. For us, greatness must come. It has to come with all kinds of grandeur and all kinds of show. God must be impressed when he comes. Not. He wasn't impressed. Instead, it was a manger. Straw. Straw. Peasants, dirty shepherds, a donkey, a smelly cow, (coughs) sheep making noise all night long, a woman about to give birth to a child. Who would have ever recognized God? God coming in such a common, ordinary way the Savior of the world. Interesting, isn't it, how in every way God chooses to come to us. We're free to simply turn our backs and look the other way. The cry of a child in a manger. Who but God would have thought of that as a way to lay hold of our human hearts forever. Our problem is we try to gild the story. We try to make it all beautiful, nice, and rosy. We have our comfortable churches that we're in. No discomfort. We're not out in the, should I say, rain. (laughs) We're not freezing. It's not smelly in here. There's no straw on the floor. But we try to make it all nice and clean and pretty. We try to provide it with splendor, grandeur, and romance. But there is no way to get around the truth, is there? That stable was a dirty, unromantic place. God was trying to tell us, you see, that holy things are lowly things, that the mighty things are not the big things, they're the little things. That's why the way God, um, that's why, that's the way God's greatness comes to us. Born small, in a sad place, often rejected, often shut out, with only a few lonely shepherds and a few wise men with the insight to see into the glory of God. 
You see, it takes a most respective heart to recognize God's knock at the door when it comes. Yes, so many times Jesus gets shut out of our lives by misread opportunities. But tonight, tonight, a child once again lies in a manger with his hands outstretched open wide to all of us. Why to you and me? And he asks, will you let me in? Will you let the Christ child into your heart this Christmas? Is there any room in the inn? For tonight, a child is born to us. Our Savior, Christ the King. Will you let him in to your heart this Christmas? It can only be Mary if we welcome Christ into our hearts today.